Okay, let's begin. So, right in the middle of this conversation about the EM algorithm. So, some of this will be elusive until we go through a concrete example. But I'll give you the basic idea, I'll give you a proof, we'll run through the example, and we'll re-talk about the algorithm. We'll run it, and then I'm going to ask you guys to code this up eventually. Um, it's a general algorithm that deals with missing data, latent stuff, uh, and finds you a solution to some maximization problem. So the idea is that you have some function here, you can think about this as a likelihood if you'd like, for right now. A lot of people apply these to likelihood functions. Um, the idea is, is that you're going to marginalize over your missing things. So they're going to average that away. I think that's a really good idea. Anytime you're uncertain about anything, you should probably average over it. So good idea. I'm going to argue this is a fully Bayesian step right here. You kind of get the idea. To average over something, I have to turn it into a random variable before I believe you have permission to do it. Um, if you don't subscribe to that, that's totally fine. You can say, I just take my likelihood functions and I average over them without talking about prior and I never upgrade it to a random variable. It's wrong mathematically to think about it. Saying that, you wouldn't be the first person to think that way. And if you think, I don't really care about if I have mathematical permission to do something, I'm an engineer, I do whatever I want. As long as it works, that works for me. Um, if you're a probabilist, and you kind of subscribe to the ax axiomatic formulation of doing things, um, then you probably are thinking you're integrating over something like a flat prior by doing this step. In any case, you're averaging over what is missing. And we're going to give you the best answer. So in terms of theta. So this algorithm is going to return a theta half and it's going to be the best answer after I marginalize out. Uh, so the maximization isn't necessarily a Bayesian step at all. You're just getting some best answer. I will argue that as statisticians, we're always going to want to describe the uncertainty in this parameter as well. And this algorithm doesn't do that. It just gives you a best guess. So if you did feel like finding the uncertainty of everything, running a maximization algorithm that's fairly quick is usually a good first step to doing things. Then if I wanted to do MCMC and understand the whole posterior, and I was building a, a Metropolis Hastings type algorithm, I might know where to initialize everything. So sometimes out of classical or frequentist, I don't really call them frequentist algorithms until I say what's frequentist about it. Uh, but once I have that sort of solution and I want the full uncertainty over theta, I usually initialize using some fast maximization algorithm. So for instance, what I might do uh, in terms of the mixture model that we will be studying, I might run something like k-means up front and come up with a pseudo, uh, an approximate answer, feed that into a better refined maximization algorithm, and then hand that solution over to an MCMC algorithm. And so a lot of times I connect all these things. And the reason I do it is because it makes my algorithms fast. So that I find solutions fast. We'll talk about that stuff later. What this algorithm gives you is your best guess in theta. That's your parameter of interest in the model. And then you have something that's latent and you're going to average over it. So again, all good ideas. The EM algorithm solves this algorithm. Now it suffers just like any other maximization type algorithm, it could get trapped in a local. So if this is highly multimodal, you need to be careful with this step where you're maximizing. And so I didn't say anything about which algorithm you might use to maximize something. Um, for the mixture problem, I'll show you the mathematical solution to this. We'll solve the Lagrange multiplier problem. We'll set everything equal to zero in terms of its partial derivative and solve for all the, the unknown parameters. Okay, what the EM algorithm does is it just follows these two iterations. This is iterative, so there is a step zero where I need to initialize everything. And then I'm gonna just solve this expectation right here. And I'm gonna come up with this function. I said this last time, typically, once you have this solution in closed form, if it's 
parametric form isn't changing, all you're doing is iteratively solving this maximization algorithm over and over again. So let's just look at what this thing is right here, this expectation. So this expectation is just the integral of the logarithm of this joint. I like to write in conditional on the data. It's always going to be in there. Eventually, I'm going to suppress this notation. But everything is conditional on the data. So this is the expectation with respect to this density function. And so this is a probability distribution on psi, at least the way I'm thinking about it, in terms of an expectation. As soon as I write that down as an expectation, I'm integrating with respect to a, a density. If this was um, discrete, this integral would be a sum. This is going to be theta t, conditional on theta t, b psi. So you might understand why I think of this as Bayesian right here. I've got some distribution on the latent stuff. What distribution is that? Oh, and I should probably condition on D again. So it has the data in there. What is this? This is a conditional posterior distribution. I don't know any other way to think about that. So how did I take psi, it was a latent parameter in my model, and how did I upgrade it to a random variable? There's only one way you can do that. Somebody help me out, what is that one way? It's the only gig in town for taking something that's fixed and turning it into something that's random. Bayes' theorem. Yeah, this is what Bayes came up with. So this is Bayes' theorem, so we're probably going to need to do some sort of Bayes' theorem in any real problem. I've asked people way back in the early part of my career when they do this, I ask them why they think it's not Bayesian. They usually just get huffy about the whole thing. So it irritates them. So how dare you accuse me? So I don't, I don't understand it. I especially don't understand it the older I get. It just doesn't make any sense. There used to be factions. Hopefully we can get rid of that. So I have heard uh, people talk about this right here is the responsibility index. We'll talk about that later. What are they doing? They're coming up with a new name so they don't have to invoke Bayes. The person I know that does that is Chris, Chris Bishop. Um, He's a, a great machine learner. He's written a, a textbook that a lot of people do use, and he's a full-blown Bayesian. So why does he do it? I think for good reasons, so he doesn't have to have the conversation with people. It's kind of an interesting ploy. Just read and name everything. Humans are flawed, so psychology seems to inundate us all the time. Okay, enough about that. Um, I need to show you that this algorithm mathematically is solving that problem. And again, it's not quite obvious because I've got these theta t's, it's an iterative algorithm floating around, and I'm not even sure that maximizing this function right here is equivalent to maximizing that function. That's what we're going to have to show. Okay, so let's start. Any questions about this before we start on the proof? Keep in mind, this proof is not in the book, and that's why I present everything to you. I think what they say in the book is we want to solve this problem, here's the algorithm, and then they go into examples of calculating things like Q. So it's like just jump, except that this is the algorithm. I remember when I saw this for the first time, I was like, I don't get it. I could code it up, but I don't understand it. So let me try to fill in that blank for you. Proof. EM works. And so what I'm really going to say is that maximizing Q iteratively is equivalent 
to maximizing the app. I'll put in the data right here. So maximizing the margin, that's the way I usually say it. Okay, so let's just write this thing out. So let's just write out what this conditional distribution is. I'm just gonna write F of psi given theta, and I'm just gonna write in the D, but then I'll get rid of it, and I'll stop using the D. So this is gonna be the joint given D over F theta. So that's the relationship between all these little bits that are floating around this algorithm. So I'll point out, you don't see this part of the algorithm. What you see in the algorithm is you see the joint and you see the margin. Oh, let me put in the D. Again, I'm gonna to forget to do that. So let me just write out, this is the same. So I'm gonna just make a definition real quick that we've suppressed the notation on the Ds. I probably shouldn't call this cap F, but I think they do it in most books. So cap F usually denotes like cumulative for you, but all cap F is, I've defined it already, is I'm just integrating over this function right here. So I have it like integrated over the theta and made it a cumulative distribution. So I think they, a lot of people just make this cap F to signify it's important. That's the thing that we're playing around with. So this is a rule that we're all familiar with. If I take the joint, I divide by the margin, I get the conditionals. And so I'll just do a little bit of rearrangement right here. So I'm gonna just write out that F theta is equal to the joint divided by the conditional. So, no surprise. Let me give myself a little bit of room. Let me just do a couple more steps over here. So I'm going to take a logarithm of everything. We know the log is in there. It doesn't really matter that if you take the log, a lot of times it's a good idea, take the logarithm, but maximizing over the log of something is the same as playing around with the original function. So logs are monotonic. Usually this makes everything easier for you. So the log of f theta is equal to the log of the joint minus the log of the conditional. Nothing remarkable so far. Let me rewrite that. Joint I was just curious if I was switching my size and my theta. If I do interchange these and I flip them around, I mean the same thing. So joint. So that's that. Okay. First step that we need to think about a little bit is I'm going to take an expectation over both sides. Here, 
did I change the maximization problem at hand? Keep in mind what we're trying to maximize is f. It's okay to maximize log of cap f. So that's the same solution to that problem. And if I take an expectation, I may have changed that problem. But this is certainly true. These are equal. Jenny, you've got a question. <laughs> what is it? I was going to ask why you're taking expectation when we start out by trying to find maximize and maximization. Yeah, exactly. So that's a good question. Why are we doing this? Obviously, there's an expectation here. So I, maybe I just throw one in to try to make it look like this problem. That's a good question. There's another looming question on the board. And I think this all the time anybody ever writes down this expectation operator. I always think the exact same thing if they write it down the way I've written it down. What's your question about it? Which expectation? With respect to what? If I take an expectation over theta, I've clearly changed the problem. So I'm not going to do that. So the expectation, again, I'm always like, please just tell me exactly which expectation. What are you averaging over? I'm going to do this with respect to psi theta t. Again, I could look over at the algorithm itself right here and see the expectation is with respect to psi theta t. So keep in mind, when I take this expectation, over this, there's no size over here. So the reality is, is I haven't changed this function. This is still equal to the log of f theta. So in some sense, I haven't taken that expectation over on the left-hand side. There's no size in there. So it's exactly the same function. Okay, so maybe that helps a little bit with answering it. I really didn't change the problem at all. This is still going to be the maximization of log f theta, which is going to give us the same solution to um, the maximization of f theta. Okay, so this is still log f theta, no size in there. But I have changed this. So in some sense, I'm dealing with the size now, and I'm trying to get rid of them in the problem. So no size over here. There were size all over the place here, and now the size has been averaged out. So I'm doing that averaging step. That's the E step. Okay, let's just look at this right here. What is that? This should look familiar. I'll just wait for a second. Is it Q? It's Q. So let's just look at it. Expectation of the joint, log of the joint. Expectation log of the joint. So I just pressed my D notation. Got rid of it. We'll remember at the end, every single step of everything that you do is always conditional on the data. You've always got all the data in your unit. So we'll remember that when we actually apply this to the mixture model. So this is Q. This is Q theta given theta t. And this is subtracting off something else. I'm going to call this S. S of theta given theta t. So this problem does look different. So I'm saying that by maximizing Q is the same as maximizing F theta. So we do understand maximizing log of F theta is the same as maximizing F theta, but this is written down in terms of this. So in general, for general functions, I can't just grab the positive part and start maximizing it because that could make this increase also inadvertently. And this is, has a subtraction right here, which would be bringing everything down. So we need to show something about this. We need to show S theta given theta t is a decreasing function. So what I really need to show is that as I drive Q up, I'm simultaneously driving S down. Now in most problems, if I saw something that was written down with this and I didn't have any context, there would be no guarantee that driving Q up is going to be driving S down. So, but as you can already see, Q and S are highly related to each other. 
And so there is this connection between this. And I'll give you the, the punchline for the proof that as I increase Q, I simultaneously am going to decrease S. Okay? And so that means we won't even have to think about S. We can just throw it away because increasing this will be decreasing that. And that's what happens. So that's what's super not obvious about this algorithm. If you write it all out, it's like Q is not the same thing as this. There's this other component. Let's finish the proof and show that this function is going to be decreasing as I'm maximizing this. Here's the sticky part of the proof that you'll need to remember something. I think watching the proof so far, this is all just basic probability. Nothing to remember so far. This is the part you need to write down correctly if you're going to get this right. I'm very inclined to ask this on the cube. Okay, so let me just write down integral of the logarithm. I'm going to write it like this. Integral of f psi given theta t plus 1. d psi. Somebody help me out. What is that integral? We're thinking about this as a density function. It's 1. Yeah, if I'm going to take an expectation with respect to it, it really is defined in terms of the density. So that's one. So what's this? Zero. That's zero. So I'm going to write this down just a little bit differently. Logarithm, integral, F psi given theta t plus 1 over F psi given theta t. So I'm just making a rearrangement. I'm multiplying by a funny form of 1. Now, I already know Jenny's question. How do you know to do this? Because you fumble around with it and you try to make a connection between the next iteration and that iteration, and you get used to doing things. So, um, 15, 17, 18 years ago, when I figured this out for the first time, of course I was bumbling around with this step and trying to figure it out and concoct this proof. So, it's not elegant. So, I'm just going to say this right here is an expectation. This is an expectation of this thing right here with respect to that. You can do this with any integral. Turn them into expectations. That's what the, the basic premise of like important sampling is. You guys are familiar with that? Turn everything into an expectation problem. Okay. Um, so I'll just write down, this is going to be the logarithm of the expectation of something, of this stuff right in here. I can write in which expectation it is, but we know which expectation it is. It's with respect to that random variable. So this is the log of that expectation. And there's a relationship to something else. There's a relationship to the logarithm. I'll write it down here to the logarithm of, I'll say, the expectation of the logarithm of something. So logarithm is a monotonic function, and there's some relationship we know between the logarithm of an expectation and the expectation of the logarithm. What's that? <laughs> Not exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. What's that? The expectation of the star is greater than. Yeah, it's greater than. Did you say that? I said less than. I, I wasn't oh, worried. Gotcha. I got water in my ear like two days ago and I'm suffering with it. 
so I can't hear anything. So, yeah, so it's a, it's a question of which way is the inequality. You know, this is Jensen's. So we're going to invoke Jensen. And how do we figure out which way Jensen's go? So I always do the exact same thing. I don't draw the picture and reconstruct the proof. If I were going to reconstruct the proof of Jensen's and explain it to somebody, I would mentally draw that picture with a straight line in monotonic functions going over or under and construct that bound out of, out of the picture. That's how I do it. If I ever want to remember which way Jensen's goes quickly, I do the same thing. So let's just do this real quick aside and figure this out, I'll try to give you a tool so you can always remember this. Let's do it right here. So expectation, this is something I can't forget, of x squared minus expectation of x squared is that's equal to the variance of x. And I know the variance is greater or equal to zero. So I know which way this function looks. So g in this case looks like that. It's prevalent. And so expectation of g x is going to be greater or equal to g expectation x when g looks like that. That's the way I remember this every single time. I remember what parabolas look like. I know variances are positive. And so this is something I can always do. So when g looks like that, the bound goes this way. Just bear in mind, I have g on the outside right here. So which way does the bound go? The bound goes this way. And that's the way I think you said it. So, I was just thinking that I'd be able to get around. Yeah, exactly. It's, I had written the g's on the other side, too. So if you're confused, I wrote the g on the left-hand side here, or the right-hand side, and I put the g on the other side here. So even though this is pointing in the same direction as that, actually I have the g's on the other side. So something for you to chew on 9 o'clock in the morning. It goes this way. So this means that this is going to be greater or equal to the integral of the logarithm of f psi given theta t plus 1 over f psi given theta t. And this is with respect to this density. So let me get rid of some of that. This thing is greater than that. That's the hard step of this proof. Now we go back into cruise control and everything just floats out. Jen, just practice that a bunch of times. So remember it. Then if it's 9 o'clock in the morning and you're taking a midterm and you're like, I can't think about this stuff, you have something you can always fall back on. I need to do the same thing. So, okay, so we're almost done right here. So what we just wrote out, I'll do it over here. So what we just wrote out was a relationship to zero. So I'm gonna forget about all this stuff right here. I bounded this by zero. So this is integral of the logarithm of f psi given theta t plus 1 over f psi given theta t. With respect to f psi given theta t. You guys are going to be astonishingly loud on the recording because you're sitting right next to the microphone. Anyway, we'll all hear what you're talking about later. <laughs> so, okay. 
Anyway, just walk through these steps real carefully. It should be all preserved for posterity sake. Okay, I can ask a question. Yes, what, please. what is SAR? Is it the that uh, This thing right here. I just called this whole thing star when I was explaining the Jensen step. Okay, hopefully that was what you can do. So this thing is equal to, I'm just going to expand this out and write it out in terms of two terms, two integrals. This is the integral of the log of f psi given theta t plus 1. with respect to f psi given theta t minus integral of a logarithm of f psi theta t with respect to f psi to infinity d psi. Let's just recognize what these terms are. Do you recognize this? Point this out. So what is S? It's the expectation of the logarithm of that with respect to this density right here. So these are both S functions. That's what S is. So this right here is S of theta t plus 1 given theta t. This is S of theta t given theta t. So let's just think about what this is, where I saw this argument right here in the s function, that was here. So this one right here is right here. So this theta t right here is that. This theta t right here is that. This thing right here is that. So if I just go back and I pattern match, that's exactly what we've written down for S. So let's just see what this says. If I rearrange this, I have a bound on what this function does. So very last step is just to rearrange this. So this says S theta t, given the theta t. So given my current state of the algorithm right here, if I evaluate it at that state, this function is going to be greater than whatever this next draw is that we get. So whatever this next iteration that I get out of this algorithm, so when I compute q, I solve for it, I get my next iteration, theta t plus 1. What I know is that this drove down s, and it made it smaller. That's what that says. So if I evaluate s in my previous location compared to the t plus first location, how did I get the t plus first iteration? I solved this problem. I plug that in, and it's driven down the s function. And so q is going up and S is going down, is what this says. Let me ask you a question. Where did I use in this where I got that from? So the algorithm says I get theta t plus 1 out of q, but I didn't use q for anything here. I didn't explicitly say I maximized anything to get it. I just said no matter what, it's going to drive it down. So this function right here, is monotonically decreasing. So what this function looks like S, I don't know if it has exactly this shape, but it looks like that, theta t. 
So anywhere I reevaluate S, other than theta T, it will make it smaller. So I didn't use Q for anything. So S is just decreasing no matter what. It's always going down. And so what that means is we can throw it away. We don't have to think about it because I'm subtracting it off. I'm subtracting off something that's just decreasing. And so maximizing Q for anything I do in Q is going to decrease that function. Maximizing it is just what we want to do. So that's the end of the proof. So S given theta t is decreasing. So maximizing Q T iteratively decrease it, maximizes it half. Log F, which is the same as maximizing it half. That's it. That's why EM works. Lots of steps. That's why I think it's useful to code this thing up and go through all these steps over and over again. And say so you never really understand this or remember it until you give it a try. You guys look like you're in pain. <laughs> Bless you. Okay. We're going to still work on this next time. So we'll play around a little bit of it with it. And you can come back after watching the video and ask questions. We will do a review session on Tuesday. Just a quick question, if I may. Um, the S is decreasing, yes. Uh, so maximizing Q, I'm missing that connection. So let's just remember this right here. This is the connection between everything. All the algorithm is doing is maximizing Q right here. So we're going to do it in an iterative fashion. So there might be one step missing right here that I, I can just iteratively increase this thing, eventually I'll get to the top of the hill. Okay, so if I just iteratively keep increasing this thing, eventually I'll find a max. You probably need to learn about the fixed point theorem in optimization to understand this. Let me describe what the fixed point theorem says. So, um, and eventually this thing will converge. Once upon a time, I was in Yosemite. And I was with a friend, and I was walking up a hill. And I'd done this hill two times that day. So people wanted to go walk to the top of El Cap, you know? So I decided to go walk up to the top of El Cap. It took me several hours to do, and I came back down. And one of my friends said, I want to walk to the top of El Cap. So I was catching the sunset. He wanted to catch it at about 1, 2 p.m. So I was like, okay, I'll go with you. And I thought to myself, I'm really tired. So I ate, I drank, I'm walking, and my friend's getting a little bit further ahead of me and is like, come on. I'm like, I'm tired. And I thought to myself, I need to reach the top of the hill. And I knew a particular algorithm. You might be able to convince yourself without any math. My algorithm just said one step in front of the other and keep just marching up the hill. And you can zigzag if you want. So you could go straight to the top of the hill, and I could pick the steepest thing, or I could zigzag a lot and walk up the grade of the hill. And eventually, I got to the top. QED. <laughs> that's my proof. So that's what people do, right? You just zigzag and switch back up the hill, and as long as you're making progress up the hill, you will eventually reach the top. You're not going to go down. And so that's what this really says in terms of everything. And so while this doesn't maximize everything in one step, it's an iterative procedure for eventually maximizing everything. So if I do iteratively march through this, and I'm just zigzagging up the hill, eventually I'll get to the top. And so if I increase this function, I eventually just maximize it right here. This is not something I need to worry about because I'm subtracting off something that's getting smaller and smaller. So I don't care about that part. 
And so by iteratively increasing this function, eventually I'll re reach the optimum of that function. Does that make some sense? Okay. So that is the connection there. So think about all these little layers to this. So it's not exactly obvious right at first. Okay. Uh, yes, please. I have one question about the distribution of S. So each time the T changes, the distribution of S also changes. S changes. So we're not having a probability distribution on it. So there's no distribution of S. So it's not a random thing, it's a function. So anytime I decrease, in, anytime I just change the numeric value and put it somewhere other than theta t, it brings down s. So it really doesn't matter that you even play around with s in the first place, because anything I do to it will just make it smaller and smaller. Kind of make sense? That's it. Let's go back to the Sarah. Final question. Uh -huh. The hill is cute, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 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 Small hole I didn't fill in. Okay. Yes. The hill that El Capitan is. <laughs> Fair enough. Algorithms are called hill climbing and not mountain climbing. So I guess mathematicians or whoever came up with all this stuff that I climbed it in real time. They're all climbers. Makes sense. It does. <laughs> okay. Chew on that for a little while. Hopefully you can just watch through the video and catch any of these extra steps. We can talk lots about this during a review session if you want. Let's go back to a concrete example. So that function, the log of the joint that we've written down, we're going to think of it as the likelihood function for now. So for whatever problem we're solving, let's come up with an example. So example, we won't get too far in this, so we'll probably recap everything, but I'll give you the important step that you need to think about, the one that everybody gets a little bit confused at on when they first look at this. So I'm going to say x, i's are going to come from a two-component mixture model. The only reason I'm doing this two-component-wise is everything generalizes. You're allowed to do grad school induction on this, but once we have to form for k is equal to 2, you can build that up to k is equal to 3 or k is equal to capital. So I'll just make it really easy just to suppress some of the notation. So this is going to be mu1, mu sigma1, plus pi2, and mu, I'll say x, given mu2, sigma2. So these are meant to denote density functions. So this is just 1 over 2 pi. 1 over sigma 1, e to the minus 1 half, x minus mu 1 squared over sigma 1 squared. And similar for that. That's just a density function. So I have a mixture between two density functions right here. I'll point out there's only one mixture weight in some ways of thinking. This is 1 minus pi 1. These are going to be positive. They're probability weights. And so all I need to deal with is really just pi 1. So I don't have two free parameters there because they sum up to 1. And so this is the model that I'm going to be sampling from. I'm going to do it n times. So just to remind you, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to flip a coin with probability pi 1 and 1 minus pi 1. I'm going to flip that coin. If it lands heads, so I, I do something with probability pi 1, I'm going to sample a point from this distribution. Let me just draw a picture. It looks something like that. So bimodal distribution, mu 1, mu 2, sigma 2, 
sigma 1. The heights of these in the area under these curves is relative to its mixture weights. So if I make this one really big, it's going to make that thing big compared to that. So again, here's all I'm going to do. I'm going to flip a coin. If it comes up, component 1, I'm going to sample from this normal distribution. If it lands heads, and I'm in component 2, I'm going to sample from this normal distribution. And then I'm going to get a whole bunch of data, and it's going to resemble these two curves. So the more data I get, the smoother approximation that will be, the more information I have about those parameters. So that's the problem we're going to work with. Two component mixture just to make everything easy. So step one, write down the likelihood function. I'll do this for you. I trust somebody in this class could stand up and write down the likelihood function right now, and if we had more time, I'd ask you to do it. In all the other years, I've asked somebody to do this. It's been a few years since COVID. We'll imagine that it's still COVID and I can't hand you the chalk. Every year, people make a mistake here. So I'll show you the mistake they make. They usually do this. I goes from one to N, and then they end up writing this thing down right here. I'm just going to write it down like this. Sum J goes from 1 to 2. They usually end up doing something like this. Sigma J. I'll write in my pi J. Right here. E to the minus 1 half xi minus mu j squared sigma j squared. So all I'm doing is I'm just taking this density function right here and slamming it right in there, and I'm just producting this up n times. And there's a slight error here. The data point, if I ended up taking this as the formula, whatever xi I'm looking at right here, xi, if it, came, if it looks like this, I know it came from component one. So there's no way it came from component two. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I wouldn't believe you. So, and if you write down the likelihood function like this, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be throwing that xi into both of these functions. So how do we get rid of that? An indicator function. xi is equal to j. I'm going to say this. I'm going to write it down like this. Cj. So this is component j. I'm going to write it as an element of component j. So if it came from component 1, this thing is a 1. If it, for j is equal to 1, so if this thing is a 1 right here, component 1, that's a 1. If it's component 2, it's a 0. So basically, this sum right here only has one term in it. All of the rest of them are getting turned off. And so this function is only being evaluated once. And in order to use this, we would need to know what the CJs are, the component labels. That's the same notation I was using last time. And so I'm throwing the component labels in here, right here. We're going to play around with this through a couple different steps. I'm going to simplify this function, but what we're going to average over are the CI, the, C, the CJs. So we're going to have to average over those. And so we'll come back next time. I'm going to rewrite this in product form. What I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to take, we don't really need the two pi, I'm going to take these things and I'm going to throw them up in the exponent. And in order to do that, I just need to take logarithms and add, add this one in and subtract that one out. And then what I'm going to also do is I'm going to shove the indicator into the exponent. And by doing that, I'm going to change this to a product form. And that's a step that a lot of people get confused about. But I could write this out as a sum that entails just really one term, or I could write it out as a product by throwing the indicator into the exponent. And it'll turn the exponent either into a zero or whatever all this stuff is.
then I'm going to take logs of everything, and it's going to be this quadratic equation that I can deal with pretty easily. Those are the steps. If you want to get ahead, all my lectures are up from last year and the year before, so if you want to see all these steps beforehand, you can go and watch those. Just take a couple minutes. Otherwise, you can just wait for me on Monday. That's it for now, you guys. Have a great weekend.